By now it should be clear that Bible translation is a very complex process. One of the objectives of these tutorials has been to allow you to work through some of the challenges that every translator faces. I want you to feel the dilemma of the translator. Not to discourage you, but to help you understand that translation takes a serious commitment of time and effort. When I worked on the translation of the New Testament and Old Testament portions for the Lamogai people of Papua New Guinea, I was committed to translating God's Word as faithfully and as accurately as I possibly could. The sobering weight of the task often drove me to my knees in prayer. By the time we finally handed the New Testaments to the Lamogai people, I can honestly say that we felt very good about every translational choice that we had made. No translation of the scriptures is perfect, but we were able to hand them this New Testament with confidence saying, this is God's Word. Up to this point, our focus has been exegesis, unpacking the meaning that is contained particularly in the first 12 verses of Mark chapter 2. Now today we're going to shift our focus and begin looking at what it takes to translate this meaning appropriately for a specified target audience. Also we're going to look at some of the key terms that are used in Scripture. All of the activity sheets for the tutorials on Bible translation are based on the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. Now we know that the NASB is more on the literal side of the spectrum. No one actually speaks NASB English, but it works well as a source language document. Now you will choose a group of English speakers to be your target audience translating Mark chapter 2 verses 1 and 12 with this target audience in mind. Before you begin translating, there are a number of key terms that you will need to consider specifically with your target audience in mind. For example, the word Capernaum. When we translated this word for the Lamogai speakers, we knew that they would not automatically know that Capernaum is a city or even a place. So sometimes we translated it, the place called Capernaum or the city called Capernaum. Also the word paralytic. Will your target audience understand this word? If not, you may need to unpack the meaning as a man who was paralyzed or a man who could not walk. What does the word pallet mean to you? To me, I think of a skid that holds cargo or perhaps a painter's pallet with the primary colors on it. For your target audience, you may need to use a more appropriate word like mat or stretcher or bedroll. The scribes in scripture were originally the copyists. They painstakingly made copies of the Hebrew Old Testament because there were no printing presses. Since they were the ones who spent more time reading through the scriptures than anyone else, they eventually became the experts in the scriptures, sometimes called the law when they refer to the Old Testament. Even by Jesus' day, the scribes were the teachers of the Old Testament scriptures and even the Jewish leaders. The word blaspheme may not be the best way to translate this concept for your particular target audience of English speakers. However, when you translate this word, you need to remember that it is a very strong, impactful word. So the strength and the impact, the intensity of it must come through. In scripture, the word blaspheme is often speaking about talking badly about God or trying to take the place of God, which of course the scribes in this passage thought Jesus was doing when he told the paralytic that his sins were forgiven. There are several other terms that you may need to consider. Faith, sin, forgive, glorify. Will your target audience clearly understand what these terms mean? The term son of man is one of the more complicated terms that translators need to deal with. For our purposes in these tutorials, I won't ask you to unpack this term. But you may need to consider the third person reference. Jesus referred to himself in the third person, saying, the Son of Man. Will your target audience clearly understand that he was talking about himself? Or could they possibly think that he was talking about someone else, since he said it in the third person? If so, it would be perfectly appropriate to quote Jesus as saying, I, the Son of Man, 
As you read this passage, there is no doubt that the hearers in that situation clearly understood that Jesus was talking about himself when he used this term. Don't get hung up on the word dug in this passage when it said they dug out an opening in the roof above Jesus. This word, this, the Greek word that is translated dug here is only used one other place in Scripture, and in that case it is not translated dug. It's Galatians 4.15 where it says, I bear you witness, if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. As you translate this word, use a word that will appropriately paint the picture of what actually happened here with your target audience in mind. Also, don't get hung up on the phrase reasoning in their hearts. Some have felt like they need to literally translate this every time it comes up. But what does this phrase really mean? It means that they thought these things to themselves. They didn't actually speak them openly. Even the NASB, which is one of the most literal English versions, does not always translate this phrase literally. In Genesis 27, 41, the Hebrew says, Esau said in his heart, but the NASB translators felt free to change it to Esau said to himself. Similarly, in 1 Samuel 27, 1, in Hebrew it says, David said in his heart, and they changed it to David said to himself. It would certainly be appropriate in translating Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, to do the same thing that the NASB translators did, if that would be better for your target audience. There is a genuine ambiguity in this passage that you will need to consider. In verse 3, it says, And they came, bringing him a paralytic, carried by four men. You need to ask the question, how many people came with this paralytic? Were there only the four who were carrying him? Or were there more people following along behind? If you compare various English versions and English commentators, you'll see that some believe that there were only four who brought him. Others believe that there was a group of people who came with this paralytic, but four of them were carrying him. Depending on how you translate this passage with your target language audience in mind, you may have to explicitly represent one of these interpretations. So far in this module, our emphasis has been on the downward arrow, discovering the meaning. And as we were unpacking this meaning, we looked at the communication situation, which of course is the entire life context, the discourse genre, it's a narrative discourse with embedded explanatory and hortatory discourses, also groupings, which includes cohesion and boundaries. What are the major paragraphs in this passage? And what are the smaller semantic groupings? And what is acting like glue, that's the cohesion, holding the smaller units together? And how are the boundaries signaled? Also, we looked at skewing, the fact that there is a mismatch between the form of the message and the meaning of the message on just about every level. We need to make sure when we translate that the meaning comes through clearly, not simply the form of the source language text. We divided the passage into its appropriate semantic paragraphs. We looked at the specific propositions in each paragraph. We also considered case roles and state relations. That is the relations between the concepts within the propositions. Uh, along with that, we considered the relations between the propositions within the larger semantic units. And just now, we talked about key terms. All of these aspects of the translation process represent the downward arrow, discovering the meaning. But now we're going to shift our emphasis. We are going to look at the upward arrow. This is where you actually re-express this meaning that we have discovered with your target audience in mind. As you consider your target audience and translate these 12 verses from the NASB into a wording that is appropriate for them, you will look specifically at the source language text, which we are considering the NASB for our purposes in this, in this tutorial. And you will also look at the tools that you have produced as you are unpacking and analyzing the meaning.
When a translation team undertakes an actual translation project, there are three key areas where there must be proficiency on this team. The target language, biblical exegesis, and translation principles. From the very first day of a translation project, all the way through to the very end, the mother tongue speakers must always be recognized as the experts in the target language. No matter how many years an expatriate or non-native speaking translator may be involved in a project, he or she will not be an expert in that target language in the way that the mother tongue speakers are. Biblical exegesis is a part of this process that will generally be the responsibility of the expatriate or non-native speaking translator. That does not mean that the expatriate translator needs to truly be an expert in all areas of the Bible. But as English speakers, we have access to the writings of the experts and we need to make use of those writings. The third area, translation principles, involves how to transfer a message clearly, faithfully, accurately from one language into another language. Initially, this will be the responsibility of the non-native translator. But as you progress through your translation project, eventually the mother tongue speakers will also gain an understanding of translation principles. Ideally, this third area should be equally shared between the non-native speaker and the mother tongue speakers. In projects where the non-native translator has learned the, the target language fluently, of course he or she can also have some input into the way that it is worded in the translation. Also, we need to recognize that the mother tongue speakers will have some input into the way that biblical truth is clearly and faithfully transmitted into their language, especially after they have received significant teaching in their own language and once some of them start teaching biblical truth to others. We as human beings are often creatures of imbalance, swinging to one extreme or the other like a pendulum. In some cases, Non-native translators have overestimated their proficiency in the target language. Sometimes these non-native speakers have simply sat down, translated the scriptures into the target language, and then they would read it to a mother tongue speaker to see if it sounded okay. Generally, the result is a substandard translation. But sometimes the opposite extreme has been true. Sometimes mother tongue speakers have been given more of the responsibility of biblical exegesis and translation principles, especially early on, more than they were really equipped to handle. We need to find the appropriate balance. And this center triangle represents the way that, that I translated and that most translators have translated in more traditional settings where Someone comes in as a religious worker, as a missionary, learns the target language and culture, and has appropriate input, is doing translation in the context of church planting. But we have to realize that some situations are different. In some cases, the, the efforts may need to be shared slightly differently. Perhaps the mother tongue speakers, in some cases, do need to take more of the exegesis and Bible translation principles roles than they did in the project I worked with. I have also had the privilege of working in some projects where I do not know the language. For example, I worked with these four African men as they were translating the scriptures into their own mother tongue. It is a language that I have not learned and I will not be learning but I am confident that, that they are producing a good translation. Even though this is not following the strategy that I followed in translating into Lamogai, we are building extra checks and balances into the process to make sure that both of the goals are the same, that the content is true to the original and that, it, that the translation is clearly understandable. And we are also making sure that all three of the roles are fully accomplished, that there is true proficiency in the target language, in biblical exegesis, 
and in Bible translation principles. For this tutorial, the first step will be to choose a target audience. A target audience of English speakers. That could be young children, it could be unchurched university students, any group of English speakers. And this will be the audience for which you will be translating. Next, you will create an initial rough draft of your translation of Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 with your target audience in mind. Now, up to this point, we have done several steps in semantic structural analysis. And as you've, done, as you've gone through these steps, you have created a tool that should be valuable to you in doing translation. However, in doing translation, you will not just use the tools that you created in the various steps of the semantic structural analysis. You will also use the scriptures as your source text. And for our purposes here, we are using the New American Standard Bible, the NASB translation of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. As you create this rough draft, this initial draft of your translation, every step of the way, be sure to keep your target audience in mind and translate each of the concepts in a way that will be clear, natural, and understandable to your target audience. <music>